Welcome everybody, my name is John Stenhouse and I'm the Business Support Manager at the University of Essex, University Enterprise Zone. We welcome you today to our series of webinars on investment readiness and today we have some eminent speakers to present on the national situation, the future of investment in the UK, the provisions that are available and the how-to to actually get about securing this. So, as I said, we've got a selection of speakers with us today, uh, and we're covering quite a range of topics. Um, my first speaker is from the Bank of England, and is Phil Eckersley, and he will be talking about the national landscape, the future, and how it's going to be predicted. Uh, and that's the crystal ball view of what's going to happen next. He's then going to be followed by Paul Sullivan from the British Business Bank, who is here to tell you about the services that the British Business Bank have already provided and what effect they're having and where they're going with their systems going forward. And finally, we have Stuart Eger, who's here to talk about where to go and get that funding. In other words, is it investments? Is it loans? Where does it fit? What's the profile? And how to go about it, the practical side of things. So I would now like to introduce Phil Leckersley from the Bank of England and Phil, would you like to share your screen and start your presentation? Thank you. Took on this challenge on the basis that um, I have to try and go through what has been such a turbulent period for the UK economy in 20 minutes. So that's quite a challenge. But we central bankers, we like um, we like these challenges. Uh, I started with some current economic conditions. Now, clearly, two absolutely enormous disruptors took place through the UK economy over the course of the last 18 months. Um, so starting with COVID, uh, this slide, I think, um, characterizes the impact that COVID had. Uh, and I've done it in terms of the GDP. So hopefully you can see uh, my cursor as I run it around the screen. Uh, this massive contraction in monthly output. You can see that the place really starting in March, but peaking through the spring of last year with a contraction of nearly 25%. Then slow recovery through the late spring and early summer as the economy restrictions eased through to the autumn when, of course, we started the next layer of restrictions. So we saw the second lockdown and the tiering scheme, which stalled this growth in GDP that you can see in this chart. Uh, and then we moved into a third phase, lockdown three, and you can see that there was no real growth in the first quarter. In fact, we saw a modest contraction. Uh, latest monthly data suggests that we're about 4% behind where we were before we went into this pandemic period. So we've still got a bit of catching up to do. So key takeaways from this chart are we haven't recovered pre-COVID levels of output. And when we decompose these data into their contributions to GDP, it becomes really quite evident that certain sectors of the economy, and this is the important thing if you're thinking about uh, investment strategies, certain sectors were asymmetrically hit really quite brutally. So just as an illustration, if we took out and highlighted food services, accommodation, arts, entertainment, and recreation, which is the pink contribution here, you can see it's about 5% of the economy, something similar to construction. And in the early stages of the pandemic, when the economy closed, the drag effect was something similar. But as the economy reopened and construction start activity started again, you can see that the impact on food services drag starts to get significantly larger than construction, and indeed significantly larger than manufacturing, which is three times the size. Moreover, there's been very limited recovery. So this element of services, which is a small element, is now accounting for nearly a third of the contraction in overall services, even though it's only 5% of total. So that just underlines, I think, the extent to which certain parts of the economy were hit extremely hard by COVID. At the same time, of course, we went through the ending of the transition period. And this threw a tremendous amount of noise in the data. And maybe the impact of uh, Brexit is going to be more of a long-term one, but we certainly see on these two charts, which show exports on the left and imports on the right, 
the short-term disruption effect. So if I just highlight a couple of factors here, you can see with these yellow arrows, this was the extent of the stock building and the build-up to the ending of the transition period. So UK importers and UK exporters found a sudden surge in demand. Then, of course, in the first few months of 2021, we saw this very sharp contraction, both in exports, exports and also in imports, again, concentrated in the EU, followed by something of a recovery. So we made up some of the lost ground in terms of our exports, less so in terms of our imports. Now, the extent to which this creates noise in the data is highlighted by the fact that um, when we look at Eurostat numbers for UK imports to the Euro area, in other words, our exports, but their imports as they're counting them, the number comes out as a contraction around 27%. Yet, measuring, we think it's closer to 12%. And really what I'm asking for really is a plea for clemency for policymakers. When you get these massive disruptions into what's happening in the economy, it makes making the adjustments, the, the appropriate policy measures, extremely challenging. So two big disruptors. Now, how did um, the authorities, the policymakers, respond to these disruptions? Well, let's look at a couple of charts here. You can see this first one is in terms of what's happened to international base rates. You have the Fed fund in blue, the bank rate, the Bank of England controls in red, and the two ECB main finance and deposit rates. So you can see here the Bank of England reduced interest rates from 0.6, sorry, uh, 5.6 from 0.75 to 0.1. That was in the early stage of the pandemic. Rates have been held there up until later later into the middle of 2021. Now, what's interesting about these charts is that the recovery path of interest rates, as predicted by market forward futures rates, has changed dramatically since February. The back in February, the dotted line in red here shows that market participants thought that UK interest rates might well turn negative in the near term through 2022. In fact, you'll remember the debate about whether interest rates were um, going to help the economy, whether they, whether they were going to be useful, etc. And there was indeed a debate on the Monetary Policy Committee within the bank as to whether they would be effective. But since then, the debate has almost left the room. And we have this forward path of interest rates here, which are highlighted with this yellow trajectory, big yellow arrow, which now suggests that interest rates are going to start climbing. They're going to start normalising. They're going to go back to some pre-pandemic levels, but it's still going to be a long haul. So this is lower for longer. Of course, even in the pre-pandemic era, we had very accommodative policy. So I just want you to consider that really the message here is that we're going to be very cautious about the extent to which interest rates recover. This caution means that finance costs are going to be lower, which means that in the cost of investment in terms of the servicing of the debt of borrowings involved is going to remain historically low. Now, while there was massive monetary policy support, there was also a huge amount of fiscal support, and you can see that on this chart. So let me just highlight the last financial year where the uh, PSMB went to just under 15% of GDP. So this Manhattan is considerably larger than what we saw in the financial crisis, which we're just circling here in 2009, uh, 10 and 11, but it's dwarfed by what happened in the Second First World War. So key takeaways here are that, although we've got a huge deficit, it's one that we have experienced in the past, but not in peacetime. Another key takeaway of this chart, which is just worth remembering, is that all of the additional support was on the spending side. So this deficit, this Manhattan, was built up by the gap between spending and receipts, but it was significantly the spending side that picked it up. And in a sense, that's encouraging. I mean, what it means is the tax base hasn't been too far eroded and the tax take has not been too badly affected by the impact of COVID. Let's move quickly to cost prices and investment. So starting with costs and prices, we are aware of this recent pickup 
in input and component costs. You can see that on this left-hand chart and on the left-hand side of that. Now, it's some comfort just to note that when input prices, so commodities, etc., go up, the supply chain absorbs around about half of the increase. You can see that in terms of the output price series. Of course, it absorbs it in both directions, so it's reasonably symmetric. When prices go down on the input side, the output prices don't contract by the same extent. So we know this is sharp rise. It's similar for services where input price increases lead to a rise in prices charged, but not the full extent. There's not full pass through. And again, you know, that's going to provide some consequences to central bankers trying to control inflation. That the recent surge in these, these prices, and here we have a couple of examples in the, in the energy front. So we have oil prices picking up sharply, and we have gas prices picking up reasonably sharply. So we know there's not a one for one pass through into final goods price inflation. Now, on the investment and uh, Lending borrowing front, we saw uh, through 2020 this big surge in the granting of government support for business. And you can see in particular the loans contribution to digital lending in part of 2020 was significant. Net finance raised by private non financial corporations uh, was out of kilter with anything we'd experienced. Um, even going back to the financial crisis. Now, what's interesting is if you look at these bars just highlighted here, but towards the end of 2020, we saw some evidence that corporate's confidence had started to recover and they were starting to repay some of this debt. And I have to say that some of these loans were just drawing down our revolving credit facilities. So this was just businesses accessing the cash that they had. But also includes the bounce back loans, the city bills, and CCFF. And you can see that confidence appears to have restored into like 2020 and 2021. Then on the investment front, again, and not surprisingly, we saw this very sharp contraction in the early part of the crisis, followed by a steady recovery through 2020. I've just highlighted the latest numbers on this, as you can see on this chart, and we are almost back. The pre crisis levels are confidence when it comes to the survey indicators. This is not the actual data, these are just forward looking survey indicators. So, but this is the important point here is that businesses' confidence as a driver of investment is starting to recover. And that's, I guess, that, you know, when you think about it in the broader context of the message that I'm conveying, it's very much about the fact that. The, the outlook appears much more optimistic than at any point since March last year. And indeed, if we turn that economic outlook, um, you know, we can ask ourselves what has improved, what's altered, how have the Bank of England's expectations changed? Well, we certainly weathered the winter better than expected. The end of the transition period has not been as disruptive as it might have been. Although we've seen restrictions tighten in lockdown three, they've eased again. We've seen a higher degree of vaccinations, which has instilled greater confidence or variants and variants. The furlough scheme has been extended to the autumn, so it will support jobs. That's the employment market. Investment jobs products are looking more positive, as we've seen. We also know that consumers have built up large amounts of unplanned savings. There's for fiscal stimulus here and abroad. With a bit of payback further out, so commodity prices and input costs have risen. So, the broad balance of information here is a net positive. And I think if you were to go away and say, you know, what, what was the underlying message that chat from the Bank of England it is about the net balance of positive behaviours that we've seen. Now, why do we think the economy is going to rebound? Well, well, because we've had experience from previous lockdowns as the economy reopens, things like bus journeys, journeys. And this is more real time data. This high frequency gives us a good indicator as to what will happen. They're all starting to pick up. You can see the ending of lockdown three taking place towards the latest vintage here in these blue lines. You can also see in the adjoining chart how diners at restaurants and visitors to retail and recreational venues started to pick up again. 
So again, another positive aspect. Now this chart on the right-hand side is interesting. Um, it's survey data, which is asking households what they tend to do with this unplanned savings. Um, and while a large proportion of people want to hold it in a bank account, a growing percentage want to start spending it. And with around 200 billion, although economists you know, differ on the exact amount, um, available, 20% of that over a short window of time reflects and represents a really strong surge in demand conditions across the economy. So these near-term demand conditions are going to pick up sharply and they're going to be underpinned by price inflation. Where we see growth house prices, as you can see, the underlying trend has been pretty strong over the course of the last 18 months, caught the extension The near-term outlook for growth looks extremely strong. You can see that in this yellow arrow I've put in the central case. We're expecting the UK economy to grow just north of 7% this year. And actually that's relatively speaking weak compared with some other traders who have predicted slightly stronger growth. What it means is that we reach the pre-pandemic level of output within or roughly by the end of 2021. So that's the two horizon where we've seen this huge contraction caused by COVID, followed by a slightly bumpy rebound, but a sharp pickup in 2021, compared with four and a half years in the financial crisis. So the disruptor effect, although greater in terms of its depth, is far less in terms of its width, its duration. Then as we move beyond this near term, we see some supply constraining in. So it's just interesting to note that this year, as the economy reopens, the bars, the pubs, the restaurants, the nightclubs, the holiday venues all reopen, supply capacity comes on stream, comes on tap really quite quickly. But once the bars reopen, it can't reopen a second time. And therefore, in 22 and 23, the ability of the economy to respond to is somewhat hampered. But we still have an output gap. At the same time, the impact of fiscal policy diminishes and starts acting as a drag on the economy. So you can see on this right hand chart that COVID related spending eases back quite sharply, that the investment allowance is positive for the, this year and next fiscal year, and the year after starts to act as a drag in 24 25. At the same time, the increase in corporation tax starts to bite. And the freezing of personal tax also has a drag effect. Remember, what we here is that it's slowing growth down. It's not turning it. So, translate that to GP4, I start to see that growth has to ease back to 22, 23, and 24, but remains positive. So the outlook for investment, the outlook for opportunities for investment continue through this period. So there's some great opportunities over the next year as the economy expands, and then just good opportunities to take place in this outline period. At the same time, we know, as I've mentioned, that inflation's picking up. It's picking up quite sharply in the near term. Some of this is just due to the mechanical effects of the contribution of energy drawing out of the series. You can see Prior to broadcast energy acted as a drag, but uh, the NITA is going to act as a stimulus to inflation. So our inflation outlook, similar to the GDP chart we just looked at, uh, quite a lot of inflation. Since this chart was drawn last month, we've had two outcomes. And I've just um, inserted those two on the chart. You can see the latest number is just outside the central case. So inflation picking up. A little bit stronger than we expected, a little sharper. So we need to keep our eye on this inflationary bull. This is conditioned on the interest rate expectations we saw in one of the early charts. So assumption that interest rate will start to increase in 2022, but won't have any dampening effect on inflation in 2021. So as interest rates, uh, higher rates kick in, we'll see inflation getting slightly uh, back to target. We can see this fan is quite wide. 
So that's why the uncertainty throughout the period is much greater than normal. But the risks are broadly symmetric, uh, and that's encouraging. So there are some risks on the downside as well. I'd now like to actually move on to the British Business Bank, to Paul Sullivan. Thanks, John, for the invitation to come along today to talk to everybody. Um, I'm Paul Sullivan from the British Business Bank. I look after the East of England, acting as eyes and ears for the bank across the region. Um, question that some of you may be asking is, who are the British Business Bank? Um, we are the government's economic development bank. We were set up in 2014 with our mission to look at the finance markets for smaller businesses, to make them work more efficiently for all of the nearly 6 million SMEs across the, the country so that they can access the funding and investment that they need to either to start out, to grow and to thrive, all of which is really important in terms of driving some of the uh, economy stats that Phil has just been talking about in his presentation because SMEs are a hugely important part of uh, the British economy itself. One of the um, parts of the British Business Bank that some of you may have come across is our startup loans function. Um, it's just gone through its busiest 12 months through 2020, um, reflecting the usual uh, trends that we see in any kind of a downturn of lots of people deciding now is the right time to start out in, in business. And they've been uh, hugely busy in terms of providing some funding for people to do that. So the objectives of the bank, I've talked a little bit about that, it's generally around increasing the supply of finance. So this isn't about moving the supply of funding to businesses from existing providers. It's all about trying to find new ways to get money to businesses that can't find that through the existing um, routes and sources. We need to do that by creating a more diverse market and widening people's horizons to the fact that there are lots of options out there for them in terms of get, getting external investment into their business at the start. Our research certainly showed that far too many people thought of purely a loan from a high street bank. They're great at what they do, but they have a market in which they operate in and many particularly new businesses and those that are seeking to grow quite quickly don't really fit with what they're looking to achieve. So we needed to create more options, both in terms of the product type and providers that are out there. We're also acutely aware that across the UK, there are huge differences in terms of access to not only the funding, but also the expertise that goes along with the funding. So we're really looking very closely at the regional impact. Where are their hotspots within a region? Why are the differences between each region? And try and help government understand why those uh, differences uh, are there and how we can do something to, um, to level out the playing field. We certainly want to do something to encourage SMEs to look at external funding. Um, prior to the pandemic in 2019, for example, only 13% of businesses took external funding. Now, that would be great if everybody was uh, had the resources to fund and move their business forward from their own uh, resources. However, what we do find is that many may only try one particular option and then give up. And again, that doesn't paint the best of pictures in terms of driving the British economy forward. So what we also want to do is try and create a centre of knowledge and expertise for SMEs that they can tap into. So I will talk a little bit more about that as I go through my presentation itself. So how do we actually operate? Well, we, we don't have customers directly ourselves. We don't have branches. You won't see a branch of the British Business Bank in any high street near you. We operate through the existing market. They've obviously got access to SMEs already. And we identify a gap in the market. We use some of our money along with their own uh, money themselves to leverage that to increase the amount of overall funding that is available to businesses. And as you can see, we work with a wide variety of types of either lender or investors. And that's very much key to us in terms of keeping this wide choice of providers and products for people to have a look at. You can see that um, in a pre-pandemic world, we had helped over 100,000 businesses access about £8 billion worth of funding that had come through the programmes that we worked on, which we were really pleased with and was ahead of the targets that we were set at the time. Um, obviously, with the pandemic striking, we were asked by government to uh, administer their emergency schemes. Phil has mentioned those um, in the bounce back loan scheme, the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme as well. And that has meant that we have reached far more businesses 
during the last 15 to 16 months to the degree that 1.6 million SMEs have taken advantage of one of those schemes to the tune of just over 75 billion pounds. So some of that money that Phil was talking about that's sitting about in the economy at the moment is where businesses have taken advantage of those funds and are naturally using those over time. Some are sitting there using them as, as rainy day funds. This is just a, a small example of some of the businesses that we work with to provide some of those solutions for uh, the SMEs that are out there. Some of them will be very familiar to you because they're high street names. Others may be not so. And that's really important for us as well to try and drive the impact that the smaller providers have that may be providing a type of funding that nobody else in the market is, is delivering. One of the other functions that the bank provides for government is to do a lot of research. And, and you'll see some of the reports that we, we write being um, replayed across social media in, in particular. Those are looking at the not just the market for SMEs, but also into specific areas such as diversity within business. How is venture capital used, for example? What is the impact of angel investment in the market, which I know is something that's very close to the heart of a number of people on the call here. Those reports do generate some quite startling statistics sometimes. Um, I mentioned only 13% of businesses in 2019 took external funding that moved to 45% during the pandemic. That in itself creates issues. Um, there will be lots of businesses that are borrowed for the first time during this particular situation, and they require a little bit of additional support, not only from the lenders, but also from the advisors and the support networks that are out there about how to deal with the debt that they've suddenly now got on their balance sheet. I mentioned earlier about the, the number of businesses that just approach a high street bank, that number is still quite high in terms of only approaching them. Now, the vast majority of businesses that approach them will get what they're looking for. They all say to us that they are saying yes to about eight out of 10 every, uh, of their requests, but it's how we support the two out of 10 that's really important to us. And we are, again, trying to widen people's horizons about what other options are out there. And I mentioned about the people that will have one contact with a lender or an investor and then give up if they all put their plans on hold if they don't get the response. So we've certainly got to do some work with people about um, maybe preparing themselves a little bit more for those conversations and understanding maybe a little bit more about what some of those lenders or investment uh, investors would like. And I know that Stuart's going to talk about that in a bit more detail with his um, slide shortly. How do we provide this information um, to businesses? Well, we do that through our finance hub. And when the slides are circulated around after, after this, you can access that via the link that's, that's on the screen there. And this is for any business, whether you be starting up, whether you're an existing business that's stabilized, a business that's looking for you know, rapid growth. And it could be that you need the money for working capital, for startup costs, or it could be for capital expenditure. Using the Finance Hub will cover all of those options. It will then look at potentially 17 different ways that you can raise money within your business, which covers all of the uh, spectrum of debt, but also covers equity investment as well, and also the grant landscape. Now, grants are, again, a growing um, source of funding for businesses. In 2019, only 2% 2 of businesses in the UK access grant funding. That leapt to 31% during the pandemic. Now, of course, a lot of those were schemes that were put in place by local authorities or um, local enterprise partnerships to help support businesses, which is great. And hopefully that will keep that part of funding for businesses moving uh, as people become familiar with how grants work, because there is definitely a, a, a knack to how you access them. But on the finance hub, all you would need to put in is what is your type of business? Where are you based? What are you looking for? Um, does the business have any assets and does the business have, uh, does it make a profit at the moment? Now, if you say no on that particular question, it probably indicates that you're a startup and it will highlight some options there that are available for startups. And what we want is to give you the information as a business owner that then can drive the next few conversations, be they with one of the providers or ultimately with an, with an advisor that can help you and prepare you for the conversations with someone that may be looking to put money into your business. Absolutely, the better prepared you are and the more you understand about what a potential lender or an investor is going to ask you, the more chance there is of you getting a, a positive option. And it's very much what we want to try to do. It's all about providing you the advice and the support to then have that conversation where you can get the actual proper advice from, uh, from a, 
somebody from a business support network, somebody from the university, for example, about what may be right for your business, because they will know what's there. We're providing the information to do that. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stuart Ager. Um, what's my qualifications for being on this call? Um, I spent uh, nearly 27 years with uh, High Street Bank lending money. Uh, mainly to SMEs. The last 12 years of that was actually lending to technology companies. So um, I sort of have, have dealt with a lot of equity investment as well as, as debt lending. The last 12 years, I've been um, running a relatively small um, lending organisation here in the east of England, funded by British Business Bank money. Um, over those years, we've lent probably nearly £30 million to so probably about well, just short of 250 SMEs across the east of England, but uh, we've also seen an awful lot of other different business propositions put in front of us. And I think people have alluded to it in previous presentations here. You know, people often go for the wrong type of money at the wrong time in the company's development um, and then get disillusioned when the answer comes back, no. Um, what I'm gonna try and do over the next very sort of few minutes is to try and illustrate in a, in a fairly simplistic fashion, where whereabouts you need to go and look for money at different stages in your business. So the first slide we've got here, funding landscape, what options available? This is a very simplistic slide. Now, there are a plethora of funding options out there from grants, huge amount of organizations out there able to provide you money. But in essence, what a really crucial thing is if you've got a business, you're looking for money, you've got to look at two different things. Where are you in the terms of your business's development? Are you a you know, startup? Are you a pure concept business? Are you just starting up? Are you an existing revenue business and you're looking to grow and develop? And the other crucial thing related to that is what level of risk are you providing to your financier? Are you a low risk business or are you a high risk business? Because that will determine who will be likely to provide you with finance. I put on here the government startup loan scheme that Paul uh, uh, mentioned. It is a very, very good scheme for very early stage startup businesses. I would encourage anyone in that, in that arena to go and have a look at it. It's very useful and can provide money, uh, a, cre a crucial part of money. It's up to £25,000 per director. The one issue it is, that it has got with it, there is actually a personal liability of the director rather than uh, of the company. So there is that little um, caveat to it, um, but it is very, very useful. A lot of businesses start up with the traditional founder, family and friends. You know, it's your own savings, family money, friends putting a little bit of money into the business, getting it off the ground. Very, very crucial part of business. We all, if it's successful, the friends remain friends. If it's not quite successful, perhaps you know, that friendship can become strained, but it's a very important pot of money. Going along the development scale, you're then looking at you know, an increasing number of options available to you. Paul mentioned grants. Within the organization that I work for, Finance East, we actually are sort of an assessor of grant applications for a number of local enterprise partnerships across the east of England. So we've seen the you know, wide range of grant schemes available. There's a lot available, but the key thing is they're not all available to every type of business. So you need to actually go and talk to the local enterprise partnerships and the growth hubs who are very good. That's their job. They're, they're there to actually talk to you as a business and tell you what's available for you as a business. Because there are Whilst the, the grants have tried to simplify the, the landscape, it is still very complicated and it is an art form in terms of applying for grants. You need to know what the criteria are. You need to know, you know what type of business you need to be to apply for different types of grants. Some are match funding, i.e. you have to put in a certain amount of money to get a certain amount of grant money. Others are 100%. There's not many that are 100%. So they're an important form of money that's available, but you have to understand that you're not going to be successful about if you apply for every grant under the sun. You need to target your approaches because they are they are they can be time consuming. You know, sometimes it's a it's 
a trade-off between time spent trying to get a grant and actually time spent on your business. And you've got equity. Basically, individuals or groups of individuals or even larger private equity organizations putting money into your business in return for a shareholding, ultimately. They have, there's different drivers for different parts of that. Now, there's, a, there's been a big surge in crowdfunding where you have crowdfunding platforms where a plethora, a huge number of small individuals will put small amounts of money into effectively a pot, which is then available to an individual company. It's become a, a significant driver of, of investment into small businesses. Business angels, traditional business angel investors, I've dealt with a lot of business angel investors. A lot of them are really good people, know an awful lot about business. But again, how do you access them? That's where the likes of you know, John's platform, the, the, Angels, the Angels Essex platform, these platforms are very, very good at putting people in touch with investors. Then down the bottom here, you've got debt, which you know, commercial banks, loans, overdrafts, et cetera. But you have to fundamentally understand with debt, it is a low cost and therefore low risk form of finance. No commercial bank will is likely to lend you money if you are a pre-revenue startup with a high risk profile. Paul's quite right, you know. First port of call from a lot of people, most people probably, is I'll go and talk to my bank. You have to understand what the banks are looking for and then understand what you're going, you're, what the, is the proposition that you're offering. If they don't align, the likelihood is, is you're going to get the answer no. What I've tried to do here is just try to condense into a few points what equity investors are looking for, in my experience. They're looking for high growth. They want to put their money into a business that is going to grow very, very strongly. They're not looking for a business that's probably might be looking to grow 5%, 10% per annum. They're looking for you know, exponential type growth. Market disruptive. I, they're looking for a business that is, has a product, service, technology that is going to disrupt an existing marketplace. Therefore, providing huge growth potential. Committed management. This is incredibly important. I'll always remember speaking to a, a very experienced angel investor many years ago. And uh, I said, what, do you, what are you actually you know, looking for when, you're, when you invest in a company? And he said, I'm looking for five things. He said, I'm looking for product, people, 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 and people. So management, who are the people running this business? Who are you? What are your objectives? Uh, what do you want to do with this business? Where do you see this business going? The most important thing for an equity investor, do your objectives align with theirs? Uh, so if you're looking at a, you know, possibly a private equity investor, look at what type of businesses that private equity house has invested in previously. Try and find out what's, the, you know, what's their sweet spots. They want you to clearly understand the market that you're entering. So you've got to do some research. So you've got to present them with a picture that shows you know your market, you know how you're going to enter it, you know what the growth potential is and you know, how you're going to execute your business plan. Critical, they want, you, they want to see that they're likely to achieve strong capital growth. They're not in it for any interest return. If they put £100,000 into your business, they're looking at possibly how they're going to get a million pounds out in probably five to 10 years. What's, you know, what's the turnaround time for their investment? Also, there, there is a, there's an increasing number of business angels who are looking at how they can help you do that. So what input and assistance they can provide you with. What, and how, how can they open their Rolodex to you, their network of contacts? So very often, you know, they will only invest in sectors where they have experience and interest. This is just a very, very pricing of, of drivers, but it's things for you to think about if you're looking at equity investment. Turning to debt funders, I mean, being a, a effectively a, a banker and a debt lender for, for 40 years, we're very cautious individuals. Um, it's not our money. The driver for a debt funder is ability to repay. So are you going to generate sufficient free cash flow from your business to repay the debt that you're requesting. So if your monthly repayments are going to be £5,000 a month and your business is only generating free cash flow of £1,000 a month, the likely response from any lender will be, well, no, I can't lend you that because you can never repay me. 
you have to convince that lender that your business that lending to your business is going to be able to increase your free cash flow generation above the level of loan and interest repayments so that you know they are looking for growth businesses they're looking for businesses that grow but probably not in the 30 40 50 percent bracket you know a five ten percent growth is actually pretty good but it's it's a lower growth trajectory but growth nevertheless businesses well banks particularly are very unlikely to fund a declining business what i found that as a debt lender that worked was the thing I, I referred to as packaged funding. So it was a combination of funding. So it was a, maybe a combination of director's own money. It might be some grant money. It might be some debt money on top of that. Quite often we've done examples. We've lent money alongside business angels investing in the business. You have to have a credible business plan. You have to convince the lender that your business is going to grow and you are going to be able to provide growth in that business, get money. So yeah, a good business plan. It doesn't have to be 50 pages, but it can be bullet points, but you've got to look at key areas. You've got to look at the areas I've looked here, put here in red. Yeah, what's the market risks? What's the technology risk if you're a technology-based company? Is, is, your, is your technology a fashion that could go out of fashion in a year's time, or is it a market disruptor that's going to change the world? Is it an Amazon, for example? There's not many Amazons around, but you know, is it that ill? You've got to show growth potential. The key thing for a lender is all about revenue. Are you in revenue already? What is your turnover on a monthly basis? Is it increasing? What's your marketing strategy? Are you ach achieving a number of new contacts and new contracts every month? Uh, is your revenue trajectory going up? Many, many business plans that I've seen over the years are incredibly optimistic on the revenue front. And invariably, the revenue slips, what we call slips to the right, i.e. you're predicting that you know, in January, your turnover is going to be 40,000. In actual fact, it may well be June, July before that's 40,000. Banks will always factor in a delay in revenues unless you can convince them otherwise that that's not going to happen because you've got confirmed contracts coming on board to support that cash flow forecast. You've got to have a product. You've got to have a service, product or service that's got market traction and demand. You've got to have a, you know, sales, order pipeline. These are all things you put into the business plan to support your cash flow, which is then proving to the lender that you can repay the debt. Management, again, is important. Maybe lending to a limited company, but actually we're lending to people. Fourth thing, and I think that's probably the same for it. It is the same for an equity investor as well as a, a debt lender. It's convincing that individual or organisation that you, as a management team, are going to be able to execute this plan. That you're, you can create that order pipeline, and that you've got strong financial controls in place. That's vitally important for a for a lender. Prove to the bank that you know what's happening to the money in your business. Don's asked me to put together some examples just to sort of illustrate the spectrum. I've got three out of numerous. They sort of illustrate what happens in businesses. First one was a, an early stage wind farm business. We were encouraged to provide debt to the business by uh, the East of England Regional Development Agency at the time. We sort of had doubts about it about the revenue streams, but we did provide some money. They slipped a long way to the right in terms of the cash flow. Revenues did not pick up as, as intended, and it, it, it failed. The business failed. We got that one wrong. I'll hold my hand up to that. It should have been, a, it was, it was a, a clear equity investment. Some equity was put in. We shouldn't have put that in. It was, a, it was an equity investment. We didn't lose a huge amount of money, but it's always painful when they go wrong. It was too early for debt. It, it was never able to service, service the loan. Second business is sort of in, in, a, in a middle one, which is an ideal, excellent example of package funding. It's a cancer screening business that's providing cancer screening to uh, big corporates for their staff. It was early, but early, early ish stage, but its revenues were growing, it had some great contracts with the people like HP, Microsoft, Viva, et cetera. But it was loss making, it was cash flow negative. But they came to us 
and we could see the potential of the business, but they were asking for too much money in terms of debt. We could see it and not being able to service the money. We put them in touch with an angels group. Some angels put some significant money in and also got involved in the management of the business. And we provided some debt alongside that angel group. That business, we provided it with a 12-month capital repayment holiday. It's now growing strongly. Its revenues have increased by nearly 200% over a year. It's now cash flow positive, profitable. The debt's been, been easily serviced. So that's a good example of a package funding. Um, the debt that's coming in released our debt funding. Third example is an established business. It was a, an East Anglian-based flavorings company, specialist flavorings company. They had a bit of a shock event. They suffered a significant bad debt at the same time as they made some ill-judged um, purchases from abroad and suffered some significant foreign exchange losses. It pretty much decimated their balance sheet. That they, they needed money to recover. They had some, they had some new contracts coming on board. They'd gone out and sought new contracts. But due to their weak balance sheet and the losses they'd incurred over the previous year, the bank said no. They came to us. We said yes. We, we basically bought into the management of the team and, uh, and their team. We could see where the business was going. It's proved a great relationship with that company. It's a very strong relationship. We've provided further loans to them to expand their factory and bring in new machinery. They've actually now repaid all our loans. Turnover has grown from 700,000 when we first knew them, which was what, six years ago. It's now 7.5 million. Um, they're now generating about one and a half million net profit. That's where revenue was, was key. We could see the revenue. It was in revenue. We could see the revenue streams. And that's why we lent in debt money. That's it's a very, very quick moment. This is the sort of thing that you could have an all-day lecture on it about where to go. The key thing is understand what risk you're, you are asking or you are providing, offering to the, the potential financier. Take advice from growth hubs, from John's group, and from people. Talk to people is the key thing. Find out who are the right people to, get, to put your proposition in front of them match your proposition with that person, that lender's you know, investor's requirements. Yeah, I, I would say talk to as many people as possible is a key thing you take away. Thank you, Stuart. And I really appreciate the, um, the, the actual real uh, examples of how it can work. It's not just a case of equity. It can be loans. It can be a combination. And that's something always to think about. Has the gap changed? pre-COVID and today in the investment market? I think sort of a bit of an intangible though, isn't it, to be fair, John? Um, you know, one of the things that we're thinking about is how the economy looks different post-COVID to pre-COVID. Uh, and you'll know what I'm talking about if I touch on, you know, what does the work from home environment look like? What do office requirements look like? Um, how have this, has the permanency of some of the scarring effects that we're looking at? So, you know, if we were thinking about um, how has investment changed in retail real estate, well, it's fundamentally different, right? I mean, people um, perhaps be far less, have far less appetite to think about making investments in retail premises than they might have done pre-COVID, albeit, you know, that there was some uh, sense of moving stuff online. It's taken a real step change. On the other hand, home deliveries, um, the so-called white van man, um, the other end of the spectrum. Would you be investing heavily in overseas holidays or in the staycation market? So, so there are some sort of impacts of COVID on the way you might think about the future path of investment, uh, which looks fundamentally different. But, but I just picked on a few small areas of the economy. I mean, by and large, one would suspect that the main drivers behind investment haven't fundamentally changed. So, you know, if you were looking at sort of the primacy of factors, and there are a number of factors clearly that drive investment, I mean, opportunity is clearly the key one. So is there a good opportunity? Is there a marketplace to invest in? Um, is there readily available finance, whether you're borrowing it or whether you are raising it yourself? And if so, what's the opportunity cost of that finance? Not, not just how much does it cost to borrow, but if you've got the finance yourself, what are you not doing in order to invest it in whatever project you're thinking of uh, spending it on? 
how much is the capital labor ratio required for this investment? So what's the availability of labor like? Is it worth investing in uh, certain projects um, where there may be real shortages of labor emerging? Should your emphasis on investment be much more towards capital intensive type sectors rather than labor intensive type sectors? So there are just a few examples, um, which are sort of some of the fundamentals that might um, you know, drive condition investment decisions. If the lender is asking for an equity share, how do you fairly know or understand how much equity is fair to give up for capital? This is an age old question. <laughs> right, um, yeah. I think, I think I can perhaps answer that best by saying there is no right answer. <laughs> but from experience, from, from businesses that I've seen that are looking for equity, experience tells me that there is at first discussion a significant disparity between what the investor would value the business at and what the founder of the business value the business at. Um, now I, I saw probably a few months ago a, an equity investment came across my desk it wasn't for us because we're debt lenders um but it was a pre-revenue business and it was then and the founder was valuing it at two million pounds and you know that it frankly that's just nonsensical um all part figures i would i would suggest that a pre-revenue business would very be very lucky to gain a pre pre a pre money valuation of, of half a million if it's in revenues and growing quite strongly you can probably double that um, if it is truly market disruptive in revenue with a, a strong pipeline you could be looking probably one to two million pounds of value but it is it is a a, dis, a a negotiation and discussion point. I would, if I if I was looking, if I was running a business and I was looking for equity investment, I would not be getting hung up on trying to seek at a very early stage in my in the process a valuation, a high valuation. I I would probably have a, a figure in my mind that I thought my business was realistically worth, but the most important thing is getting the getting the investor interested in the business. And hung up and, and really engaged with you in discussions, detailed discussions on the way forward. You know, don't put a bit of valuation out there that would immediately turn off you know, pretty much every investor you, you're likely to come across. Because the answer is, is then is, is, is they just get a simple no because they can't justify the investment. I was going to say, I don't think there's any substitute here for talking to somebody that's done it before either firsthand or somebody like yourself through your platform that is helping businesses to do that, to get a bit of a reality check on, you know, the, all of the things that, that Stuart's kind of talked about. It's not something that would be sensible for any business entrepreneur to, to do on their own. Um, if there are horror stories out there, it's generally where people haven't taken advice and they haven't sought support beforehand and have leapt into something because it looks like it's the only thing that's available. I've just fired into the, the chat the link to the UK BAA's page for entrepreneurs, which has got some help and support on that. And, you know, John, your, your platform, you work very closely with UK BAA. So sources of information like this, I think, are really vital for people when they're helping um make those decisions and dis deciding whether to enter into a contract with an investor we constantly uh we are looking at valuations which come across our desk on a daily basis and we go really and of course it depends whether you're going for the uk market the american market uh it it really depends on the individual case and yes i agree with all the comments so far which things on the horizon should we be concerned about Inflation, unemployment, the euro, the US economy, or anything else? Anything else. I, I referenced it a little bit in my presentation. I think the thing that to be concerned about is the number of businesses that 
have just borrowed for the first time or just about to step out into that journey and how prepared they are for that both in terms of securing the funding but then also managing their business and their cash flow and their available cash going forward to meet those obligations with so much new debt out there in the market that is probably something that i hear most often from stakeholders across the region about what's causing them concern and that businesses will trot on and do it try and do it by themselves without seeking some help and support um, for me that's the biggest concern i i i agree with Paul, that there are businesses that have taken on significant levels of debt, and I'm not sure that over the next two to three years, well, so it's starting almost now when a lot of these loans are starting, you know, repayments are starting to, to kick in. I'm not certain that business, all businesses will survive. So my greatest fear is that there is there is a significant uptick in insolvencies um, and the impact that could have on um, business confidence and also the lender's ability to lend more money mm. if they start getting hit with significant bad debts um, that's that's i think all the concerns that, that the person who's asked the question has raised our concerns they have legitimate business issues and they will always or always things that businesses should be considering how they impact on your business but you know there's quite a lot of things that you can't control and you just have to make sure that your business is in the best possible position to to meet any market challenges out there and also take advantage of any potential market disruptions that happen it's all about risk running a business yeah i mean there's lots of themes there so all of the above certainly needs the attention of policymakers. um i would add government debt to that you know the government's assumed a huge amount of debt it needs servicing if interest rates recover something back to normal then there's only two ways you can really go about collecting more money you either tax the existing tax base more heavily or you grow the tax base uh, and it's far more preferable to do the latter so, the, you know, the government needs to engender a climate that allows businesses to expand, which is all part of the story we've been hearing, you know, more investment, greater employment prospects, et cetera. And if we can do all that uh, and keep debt servicing costs low, then we may well expand or grow our way out of this crisis rather than uh, just have to tax more heavily. Yeah. And I think equity investment is possibly one of the answers in that uh, others take the risk. The equity investors are taking the risk, but they're also using their expertise to build businesses, which they presumably had good experience of doing in the past. So that that's something that lots of new or younger entrepreneurs don't have those life skills that are needed to actually uh, tackle all of these issues which we've been discussing today. I think it has been a problem in the UK economy over the last probably 50, 60 or more years. Businesses have relied too much on debt and the you know, role of investors has, has not been as prevalent as it should have been. You know, yeah. they, they can bring an awful lot to the business and it's not just a check with, a, with an amount of money written on it. It's their expertise, their contacts, you know, how to run a business, how to be successful, how to overcome the challenges that every business will face at some stage in its development. Thank you to my panel of speakers today, um, for Phil, for his uh, valuable insights into the golden future that we're all going to face, provided that we watch all the pitfalls along the way. For Paul, for demonstrating that the support is there, you've just got to go and find it. And for Stuart, for telling us where to go and find it. So thank you very much indeed for the panel today. I fully appreciate it. My name's John Stenhouse, Business Support Manager, the University Enterprise Zone, University of Essex. You've been watching the Investment Readiness Programme under the Space to Grow and Angels at Essex Programme. Thank you once again. I look forward to meeting you again in the future. Goodbye. <laughs>